Okay, everyone sit down. We run a tight ship here. And as soon as my panelists get on the ship, um, we'll go. That's you. Oh, am I mic? Am I on? Hello. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, are you cold? Yeah. Really? People seem to be cold. Ms. Mita had to leave. She had a personal thing that she had to deal with, so she didn't storm out, and we're very unhappy that she's not here, but she did have to leave. Um, I think what we're going to do this afternoon, we're going to talk for another hour, and then we'll turn it over to the California things. But before we do, I just wanted everyone to sort of say something about, address what they thought could be either easily solved or the biggest issue that maybe we haven't talked about. And I'm just going to go down and put you all on the spot, and you don't actually have to respond if you don't want to. But we'll start with you. I have no issue that can be easily solved. <laughs> but I, did, I wanted to make one small point. People said we need better plants. That's, that's my uh, rubric, right, better plants. And so I was thinking about this, especially with respect to water. So there is something called the water use efficiency, which is how much matter you produce per kilogram of water. And I think 40 years of plant breeding of wheat in Australia has produced wheat, which increases the water use efficiency about 1% per year. So it's wonderful that now after 40 years, we have wheat that is twice as water use efficient. And it's also sobering that 1% is as good as you can do. So there is no magic bullet. Uh, nobody is going to produce uh, plants. Nobody is going to make the desert bloom with plants that uh, use no water. Uh, it's a slow process. I guess I have two answers. One is uh, we need it all. We need, we are addressing a complex problem. So we need comprehensive solutions that involve the science, the, the improved plants and uh, um, improved animal health uh, uh, technologies and so on that come out of the laboratory. We need markets. We need uh, improved agricultural or, and rural economies. We need attention to uh, sustainable intensifications that we're dealing with uh, the constraints on natural resources. Uh, we need uh, solutions that address gender and gender inequities. Um, and we need uh, a, a laser focus on nutrition because you don't solve nutrition just by solving hunger. Um, so that's the, the first answer is we need it all. But the, the second answer is the, 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 the key ingredient that, um, that really makes the difference country by country as to whether they get on the path towards solutions or not, and that's political will. And if you have political leadership, um, you, you really can develop the priorities and, and develop the programs to get those, uh, th those adopted and maybe take in the help of international donors, international organizations, and so on. But it has to start with political leadership. First, I'd like to thank everyone for being here because I, it gives me great hope as a young 20-something that there's a lot of people who care about these issues. Um, uh, as my esteemed professor Ananya Roy at UC Berkeley said, poverty and hunger is not the lack of a cow or a plot of land, but the violence of disempowerment and deprivation produced by a long history of systematic exploitation and disinvestment in communities of the marginalized. My generation, the 20-something students, understands that inequality and hunger cannot be solved with just technology or science alone because geographies of poverty, malnutrition, and neglect can be directly traced over socioeconomic status and therefore, solutions to feeding the future by 2025 must be addressed in terms of distributive and social justice. We've been dodging around the question of what sustainability is and what it means, but I think food must first be a source of nutrition before it is a commodity. And sustainability really is at its heart equity over time. That gives equal consideration to present and future needs. 
I think collectively we must reaffirm a personal and national commitment to standing in solidarity in the context of global inequality related to food distribution. Okay. That should hold us. Thank you. First, I want to just say, sitting next to you gives me hope. So <laughs> I wanted you to hear that because it is true. And part of that truth is what can we do now? What we can do now, we, all of the people in this room and, and us on this platform, uh, can be involved in helping to provide new ways of training the next generations that are coming. We need to do this. We need to make food systems a primary theme. We need to integrate all the different areas of expertise into, into educating about that and opening it up. We need a food core that's the equivalent of the Peace Corps uh, that brings people from the United States out to other places and then back and reconceptualizes what we're all about with regard to uh, our understanding of food systems and the need to solve the problems. And finally, I'll just say simply, solving the problem uh, will be a spiritual quest as, as much as it is a scientific quest to, in a sense, echo the things you just said. And part of that can be done right away by all of us, which is just decrease our waste. Just decrease our waste. Every place you see waste food, that's a way to begin for all of us. Uh, and to join together to do that. Thanks. Uh, people got to eat now, not tomorrow. It's, <laughs> it's, we got to have short-term solution, medium-term solution, long-term solutions. They, gotta, they have to have water today. They have to have water tomorrow. Uh, notwithstanding uh, the, the complexity of delivering it, they must have it. Uh, we need uncommon collaborations. That's one of the specialties of, of the work that I do is uncommon collaborations. People that normally wouldn't come together come together. And I think we've got to solve what I consider science fiction. Um, pretty much everything that's been discussed is kind of like pedantic on a certain level. And what is the science fiction of agriculture for the next 25 to 50 years? If, if you all put down on a piece of paper, what is the thing you would like to see solved? We'd probably have you know, 100 different versions of that story. Mine's nitrogen fixation. I've only worked on it for 40 years. Uh, but perennial wheat has been worked on since 1930, more or less. So what are those science fiction things that cause us to go after moonshots? You know, when, when are we going to have a Kennedy stand up and say, we need to go and put a man on the moon, but have that person say, we need to end malnutrition, chronic hunger, and make sure everyone has water available? So I would concur that we need political will and some of these other things. Let me just say a little bit about that I, I think if we're really going to do this, we need to, in, one of the pieces that we need to do is to think about how to in, increase the productivity of smallholder farmers in poor countries. Um, women farmers, men farmers, household farms, um, yes, it's true that just simply increasing, increasing their productivity does not necessarily turn into higher incomes. We heard about coffee. Um, but it's also going to be the case that they're not going to move out of, those farmers are not going to move out of poverty unless they're able to produce more, hopefully more food, which they can consume if the prices um, change, go down. Um, so it, that would in, both impact their own consumption as well as the income that they have. We also, I mean, somebody said that Farmers are smart. I think that's true of farmers everywhere. And so when we try to understand why farmers are in, in Africa or in India or wherever are not adopting some of these kinds of technologies that we're talking about, it's because it doesn't make, those technologies don't make sense for them where they are. It may be that there's not enough inf infrastructure to get the inputs to them and the outputs if they produce more to markets, it may be about markets, it may be a whole lot of things, but we need to really look and try to ask the questions about why, why does it not make sense for them to do this, and are there kinds of programs and projects that might be able to make it possible so that 
we don't then have to do a lot of work to get farmers to adopt technologies that are good, right? Once the technologies are there and they're profitable, farmers everywhere are going to, to take them up. So thinking about what the institutional kinds of situations are that make it so that they are not profitable is one of the places that we need to look. Um, how are you supposed to answer that question? That's you know, it's your if, problem. All right. Well, okay. Well, I how about asked. this? I think we need to elect Elizabeth Warren president in 2016. And we need a social movement to hold her to a mission to return us to some sort of notion of the public good. President Udoff talked about the public mission of the University of California system this morning, and that's been echoing in my mind, because how do you fulfill a public mission if, if you don't have enough money to do your work and your research? How do you fulfill a public mission if you're dependent on corporate dollars, uh, uh, money from corporations that don't share the public mission? And on a global level, how can we, how can we uphold sort of international public and social values and goals if our political leaders basically are supplicants to leaders of the largest corporations and Wall Street firms. And I think that, you know, I, I just pick Elizabeth Warren as somebody who I think has a clear understanding and isn't bought yet, has a clear understanding of the fact that we need really serious controls on the power that um, the finance industry in particular exercises in the political realm and, um, and in the economy and society in general. So. That's my answer. And they say I have a bleak view. <laughs> Which view? Bleak. Oh, bleak. Well, the, the precedent has been set, so I, I actually have subdivided my answer. Um, no, it's fine. So, yes, well, um, <clears throat> so I have a kind of social science-y answer, uh, since I'm not a molecular biologist or an ecologist. The social science-y answer is that um, many of the things we're talking about need to find a middle ground between state and market solutions in a way that is defeated by magical thinking. We're not going to decommoditize food. Let, let's, just, let's just face that. Uh, food will be produced in markets by people who are responding to market signals. Their mix of crops is going to respond to markets, and I'll say something about that in just a minute. But markets need not dominate the allocation of everything, who gets what and how and when and what is to produce and how much is to be produced. There are ways around that, right? And one of the things that I've learned in looking at the social science-y kind of take on what we might do at the local level um, is that we can insulate farming communities from market shocks. You can insulate whole nation states from farmer shocks with social policy, the kind of the basic social democratic guarantees of economic security that is delinked from market forces. This is not impossible, and there's a lot of work by a superb economist at Berkeley named Pradab Hardhan on how that would be possible in India at a reasonable cost compared to the hodgepodge of sort of politically driven things that we have going on now. And the second part of that is to revalorize, to revalorize rural areas. It's true that not just farmers are leaving the farms in my part of the world, it's also the bureaucrats, the teachers, the young people with skills. Everyone is leaving the farm because of the, the kind of attractions of urban life and incomes. Okay, that's, uh, that, that, that's my social science -y point. Can I do, is that, am I well, cut? it's just, we'll, you will come back to you. We, we're not going to be able to digest all of those points at once. We're not, we're not good enough. Can we're I, not worthy. Can, can I do my second point that's easier? If it makes you really happy. But, but could it? Uh, that's too much. Well, my only, I just want people to be able to discuss your excellent points. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, my second point, my second point is a lot easier. Um, this is my wife's favorite saying uh, when I complain about things can't be done. Uh, she says, your problem is that you make the perfect the enemy of the good, and that's folk wisdom. And we began this discussion with something like golden rice. And the immediate response was, it's not a silver bullet, we'll solve all, solve all the problems, we need to address every kind of micronutrient deficiency in the world. The point is that high ferritin and high beta carotene rice for poor people makes a huge difference in their life. Now, it's not a silver bullet. It does make a huge impact in children's lives all over the world, especially on, on poor countries and rice diets. Why do people oppose it? It's a GMO. OK, it, this now is, we're going to discuss that. But, you're, this is, but my time is over, OK? For the moment. <laughs>
I, I'm, uh, We're going to come back to it. I, it shows your authority that I accept that. Okay. <laughs> I've never been more flattered. <laughs> Don. Okay. okay. Um, couple things. Um, one is uh, I believe that we need to recognize and appreciate all types of agricultural production in the world. I mean, we have, we've heard the term industrial, we've got organic, we've got conventional. You know, all of these systems contribute to the feeding of people. Uh, people have various needs, uh, various economic um, uh, viability in terms of what they can purchase. And, and, you know, in some countries, they're much more highly regulated than others, and I think you just have to let that take care of itself, but recognize that, that we have to continue to produce the food that we're producing and incrementally continue to increase it to help meet this demand. And at the same time, we have, as, a, as this country and I think other countries need to recognize the value of education, of agriculture, and institutions like a &R to provide the resources that are necessary to help other people. And I've said this before, and, and I talked to Tom Tomich a little about this at the break, and you know, and, and one of the, you know, and I've said, well, we'll just go over there. Well, maybe, you know, maybe the mechanism is we need to start bringing students in to this country or to, you know, but, but, but we, the education is a key part. And to me, that's all under the radar of politics. The political stuff is going to take too long. And, and we've got to figure out a delivery mechanism that's, that's under that the politics, and I know you have local politics too, but, but you know, we're doing a lot in the world and, and I think we just need to, to provide more dollars for that. Brian. I, I really like uh, Wes Jackson's point about how we are, um, in a certain sense, um, still living in a Ptolemaic world and we're, we're coming up with these epicycles to, to hold it all together. And I, I think so much of the, uh, the, the, the moves by uh, bankers, economists, and that whole global capitalism, it's, it's trying to get the system just to hold it together a little bit longer, a little bit longer. And, and Wes Jackson's idea was so radical that it's, it's just a step out of that and into the idea that the nature itself has, is just loaded with wisdom and insight so that that cheers me up because it's, it, it reminds me of how little we know and how much there is out there to learn. And um, just a segue, I, I was thrilled about the green water. I thought there would be big water wars and so forth, and suddenly there's all this water like floating away, and we, if we, with our intelligence, we can find a way to get that to flow into the plants. I mean, that was, that was thrilling. <laughs> I want to... Uh, I want to uh, to say something about Wes Jackson's talk as well. I think that's, that's one of my first of, of my two points. First is you can ask short three. points. These are very short points. Uh, the first one of them is, that's right, design with nature. That's right. Not compete with nature, not dominate nature, design with nature. Learn from nature. There's a lot out there already understood. We're understanding more. We can, and it's complex, and we can move that into into uh, short-term gains in food production as well as longer term. And I'm speaking now about ecology not just above the ground, which is most of what we heard today. Ecology below the ground is also very important, and that's where there's a greater biological diversity than all the above ground plants, and there is more water than above ground. Remember that two-thirds of the fresh water in the world is green water flow, not blue water flow, green water flow. We tap one-eighth of that right now for crops, that's all. We can, we can do a lot better than that on a short and a long term. That's point one. Point two is don't be tied to an ideology. Don't be tied to an ideology. Do what works and then undo the bad stuff as you learn from, from your mistakes. And that is a good example, ideology being tied to ideology of the perfect being the enemy of the good. Don't be tied to an ideology. So 
let me just say that what I'm hearing from almost all of you is, let's not let the enemy of the perfect be whatever, the, you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Let's use all the tools we have while recognizing that none of them are pieces of magic. Let's not be unrealistic about our political possibilities, but move forward in different ways in different places. And I think that's all great, but it makes me wonder how we're going to do that because there are many, many people in this country and the world who bitterly object to using scientific knowledge to move agriculture forward. And the history of modern life has been people saying, we're not going to make it, we're going to die, we're not going to be able to feed the world, and our brains solving that problem. And I have no doubt that our brains can and maybe already have solved that problem again, but we can't use our brains if we're not allowed to use the crops because Greenpeace won't let you use golden rice. I mean, there are endless numbers of examples of people just objecting to trying things out, just even putting test crops in an acre in the ground. And I wonder how we're going to go forward if that remains the way we approach the world, because it is how we do it. Yeah, I, I want to respond. Um, you know, I, I, as I said earlier, I think that's one of the tools that we have. And, you know, the ag industry is not static. Um, there's research going on now with um, in irrigation technology, nitrogen management, um, and and so so there's a plethora of activities going on, uh, and there may be a different option in this process. But it's and a metaphor. It's not GMOs. It's an inability to even push forward with science. You said it yourself. You said you don't grow certain crops because of political opposition, not because they're not useful, not because they're not nutritious, not because you can't make money, but for political reasons. Now, for us, it is a financial hit. Well, okay. it's a financial I mean, hit because... Uh, you know, and I think for most farmers, I mean, you get into some of these trade issues and, and you, I mean, if you can't make a profit, I you're agree. out of business. And I, and I think if it's, if it's the individual farmer that's trying to feed his family, if he can't feed his family, he's out of business. And so, I mean, that, that scales up to, to the mega farms. I mean, it, you know, there has to be profitability in this, in this for everyone. I, I mean, for the, for the farmer or it's not sustainable. Uh, and you're and so um, um, we don't grow it because our business would not be sustainable if we did. And, and you know, but, uh, but we're I sustainable understand. without growing it, so you we, are. we make that. Yes, right. Well, with, with apologies to Professor Herring, I think that's a red herring. <laughs> Frankly, thank you, thank you. I've never heard that before. I'm, I'm, I'm here all week, folks. Brand new. <laughs> the, we, you know, one of the things we heard repeatedly this morning was that, that, you know, GMOs are going to be a very small part of the solution, if they're part of the solution at all. And there are lots of things that people could be, I mean, there are lots of aspects of people denying science that I'm concerned about, including some of the inaccurate stuff that people say about Franken foods or whatever. If I were gonna put my money on a denial of science that is, that is holding back the world, it would be the denial of climate change. It wouldn't be the denial that, you know, which is a small part, I think, of the total number of arguments you could make about genetic technology. I'm not that making an argument about genetically engineered food. I'm making an argument about a world that refuses to even look at scientific advancements for non-scientific reasons. I, I don't think that's I, our biggest problem. I can, I can respond to that in another way, which is if you, if you think about food, we always have to think about food safety. There's a reason for that. It's because when food is, is unsafe, you get sick from it, and, and that becomes a huge negative. So there's a fear of negatives. And when there's some group that goes around, whatever that group is, that goes around and, and, and harps on the fears, fears always trump 
the, the rational thinking under those circumstances. So, so what we need is a very careful bulwark of, of safety so that uh, people believe in the labels of food, whatever those labels are. I don't want to get into the labeling issue with respect to this, but, I, uh, but there it is. But the point is, is that people have to believe it so that look in the UK in the, in the last month or so or six weeks with horse meat coming into the labeling process. Look what that did to a whole industry in a, in a moment, in a, in a quick snap of the fingers. People were fearing all kinds of problems. We know probably there wasn't much of a negative health effect of that, but the, the enormous impact that that had uh, is extremely important. So what, our combat anyway is simply to have very carefully trusted sources of knowledge and information, and that obliterates this unsafe uh, okay, I, I think we probably shouldn't continue this, because I would just say, after decades of planting a certain type of crop with some safety record, we have that, and it doesn't matter. But I'm more interested in the climate change thing, because I think it actually is a bigger deal. But how do we address that? But let's go back just to, to, to a little bit of closure. It's called the precautionary principle. I'm well aware. And when you apply the precautionary it. principle, what can possibly pass that conversation? Essentially nothing. And some of us are old enough to have taken the soft vaccine on a Saturday morning. It was great. We didn't have to go to synagogue that day. We got to go in line and take a sugar cube. But there was a danger that something would happen, and some children did get polio from the live vaccine. The fact is, it's pretty much eradicated a really big problem called polio. I, if, if we allow the conversation to always go to the precautionary principle, there's no way to overcome it. So I, I guess what we do, and I'm speaking from an industry perspective, we build uncommon collaborations. So farmers, governments, uh, people like USDA, ARS, IBM is a big partner of ours. We go in and try to solve a problem, and we understand what it is. And it's pretty hard with that many people working towards an end goal to say, well, oh, I don't know about that. I'm going to apply the precautionary principle because everyone has agreed that that can't exist in this conversation because so much is at risk. Uh, I agree. I do think, however, we have a big problem with the precautionary principle, and we're not going to solve it today. And we probably, of course, can solve the climate change issue. So <laughs> we should move on to that, I think. I mean, just because I don't think we've addressed that, the relationship between climate change and these other issues enough. And I kind of don't think these other issues matter if so we're five degrees from hotter. From a plant than science perspective, we have to go after adaptability. Everything we're doing is about adaptability to variants. And recently I read a piece from Oak Ridge National Lab that there was really not a measured drought in the Midwest. There was episodic rain that fell at the wrong time, which caused a drought of plants. But if you measured the accurate rainfall, there was plenty of rainfall. If the plants would have been bred to deal more with episodic rainfall, climate change adaptability and, and using the, the, we were having a conversation earlier that you must have some water for plants, but can we re, I almost said it, re-engineer the plant to work with water differently in a way we haven't before and still get the growth. But adaptability is the only thing we've got going if we have a hope to feed nine billion people in whatever number of years it is. I wanted to speak to an aspect of that very same point, <clears throat> which again reiterates the point I made earlier, and that is uh, recent work shows that uh, resilience and resistance both to drought in the above ground part, the plant, actually is to a major extent driven by the selective pressure that the plant puts on the below ground biodiversity, which are the microbes. The microbes actually create materials that store water, help the plant survive in a dry period, and so forth. We're just beginning to learn about them. This is the soil microbiome. It's the analog of the human microbiome, about which Michael has written very well, uh, which keeps us healthy, by the way. And we've brutalized it with antibiotics and all that. That's another story. But the point is that we're just beginning to learn about the soil microbiome. An incredible amount is done for the plant by the, all of these micro creatures living in symbiosis with the roots. And that's been worked out by, by nature for a very long time. It's just that we never tapped into it because it wasn't obvious, just like the green water. So if we use both, if we understand that 
that plant breeding or whatever engineering you want for the above ground part can help, but so can working with the below ground part. That together, I think that problem can be solved, actually. But that, that seems so promising. Uh, just how can we have that happen? But, but the interesting thing about the adaptability is um, most commodities um, have breeding uh, programs. Uh, strawberries, I, see, I went to Driscoll a couple months ago, they have 40,000 variety, varieties of strawberries out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the rice industry does, and, and you're, you know, when you're looking out 5 to 10 to 15 years in terms of varietal development, and you know, as the climate, you know, and so as this change goes on, these varieties are being exposed to change and the, you know, so there is a certain amount of adaptability that's happening in the selection process uh, already. And and so, you know, a, as a farmer, I'm less fearful of my my the varietals that are coming down the road uh, as than than some of the other changes like lack of water uh, that, that could impact us tr a much in a, a much more dramatic fashion. I'm sure you're right, but like Cheryl, for instance, do you think women, you know, I'm worried that women in Africa who are the people who have to be farmers aren't going to have that sort of flexibility. Yeah, I was going to say, in thinking about adaptability, we need to think about it in terms of the crops and the plants, and we certainly do, but I'm going to leave that to the people who do that. Um, and we need to think about adaptability and the human adaptability, and so how do we put in place social systems to facilitate people so that they, and particularly the most vulnerable, are not hurt the most. Um, so some kinds of social safety net programs um, for people who are really being impacted by climate change is going to be one of the key pieces I would think we would have to do. And does that have to come from individual governments though, right? Or, I mean, how do we do that on a broad scale? It probably needs to come from higher levels than community levels, because communities are going to be hit by the same kinds of climate impacts. Right. Um, but state levels, regional levels, um, and probably some international levels. So a mix of those, I would think, is going to what. And, and I think the other thing that kind of came up a little bit earlier is that we need to think about creative um, institutional ways to deal with some of these. So thinking about how some of the corporations can actually pair with NGOs to, so that the NGOs can work with farmers to figure out ways that particularly working with women farmers can produce more when there is now through the corporation a, a market channel. We want to make sure that there's not just a monopoly and that they don't have, um, that they're actually paying fair amounts to, to the farmers, but thinking about some of these new kind of institutional arrangements will be important as well. Martin, did you want to say yeah, something? But, uh, I wanted to bring it, the conversation also back to farming systems maybe, which is also important. And so farms have to be productive and there has to be a profit for the farmer. And yet, although maybe this is conversation for later this afternoon, all these profitable farms in California are in those counties that have the greatest poverty. Mm -hmm. So all these profitable farms have all these people in poverty. Does that mean that we are not on the right track? Uh, that this is not the right farming system for the people of California and maybe by extension for the people of the world? I, d I don't know. I'm not, it's not my area, but I'm worried about this. And I didn't know the statistics until I saw it, either you or... Uh, the next moderator send it round to all of us that these are the, the counties with the greatest poverty. That I, have, that's way too interesting for me to have sent around. It was uh, Mark. <laughs> that have the most profitable farms. Yeah. Is this true? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I think this around adapt, uh, adaptability and resilience, there is a win-win opportunity. And I really agree with um, the first part of um, Professor Herring's remarks about <laughs> finding ways to cushion communities and even nations from price shocks. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's true at the farm level as well. But there are two kinds of shocks out there. There are price shocks that have to do with incredibly unstable uh, financial markets and commodity markets, and there are the kinds of shocks that are associated with climate change and are associated with extreme weather events, et cetera. And so 
things like um, buffer stocks of grain, things like policies that give greater policy space for promotion of uh, domestic production, things at the, you know, institutions at the local level that can help communities bounce back more quickly from shocks, whether they're climate related or uh, related to this wild financial ride we're on right now. Okay. I think are, there are many of those and, and West Africa right now, there's a World Food Program experiment in developing uh, regional food reserves um, rather than country by country or community by community. Huh. So there are some possibilities out there, but I, again, it also involves protecting from shocks by controlling the financial, you know, financial. And it also, the thing you raised before, if people deny climate change is either existing or going to be a powerful impact on billions of people's lives, it's hard to motivate to do any of this. And we, I mean, we have that problem in a very, I actually, when I wrote a book about denialism, I did not include climate change for which I was roundly attacked. And the reason I didn't is I thought it was settled science and that it wouldn't, it was, that I wanted to attend to things that weren't. And it, I was, couldn't have been more wrong about anything. I actually probably was more wrong about other things. But, you know, it's, it's not something that people will stop. And it's a problem. Yeah. yeah good. I, 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 Michael, I like the way you raised the larger point about what the Bush administration used to negatively refer to as the reality-based community, right? Um, that, that is, science-based policy really does face an incredible uphill battle. There are still people in large numbers who believe that there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and that Al-Qaeda was sponsored by Saddam Hussein. That, and what I think is happening, there are two things that are happening that affect our discussion today. Um, one thing is the channelization of knowledge. If you watch Fox News, you will hear that repeated over and over and over again, weapons of mass destruction and so on. So that there, this channelization means that the websites you visit, and there's actually empirical evidence of this, that the websites you visit tailor what you get when you search for something. And, and that, that is something that creates alternative communities among us, so people that firmly believe that all the farmers in India are committing suicide and da 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 da. That kind of story is widely believed because they're a channelization. Secondly, information costs are very, very high, especially with regard to agriculture. People do not know that the traits that we have in our plants now, they don't know where they came from. And so something like genetic engineering sounds kind of scary. And actually, you know, in, in India recently, there was a battle over a, an eggplant, right? A, an eggplant with a Cry1AC gene that, that made it uh, resistant to insects. People got really freaked out about this eggplant, and it was defeated after nine years of research studies, open field trials, and so on and so forth. And India has been growing a mutagenic eggplant since 1975, in which the entire genome was blasted by cobalt-30 radiation, but it's not coded as a GMO. Right, no, that's but nobody true knows in other that. countries. Nobody knows we that. We love mutagenesis. It's just x-rays all over. That's right. But, but I guess my, my, my point here is just that, that we know very little about agriculture, where our crops came from, how they're grown, what's natural, what's unnatural. And so we become victims of epistemic brokers with the high information cost. And this is true in climate change as well. I don't read climate science. So I have to pick the right network to know where the science is settling and what solutions are plausible. So we're all victims of our networks and our epistemic brokers, but it matters enormously because science has got to be the basis of the toolkits that we can use to solve some of these, these really pressing problems, I think. Yeah. Uh, so in, in terms of the uh, ways we respond to the challenge of climate change, there are several. One is, um, is through research, and I mentioned before the, the heat-tolerant uh, 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 wheat project that's being done through the University of California, UC Davis. Um, we're also uh, supporting research on, on submarine or su submergence-tolerant rice, um, which could benefit 120 million people across uh, um, primarily South Asia, um, you know, because obviously climate change has different impacts depending on where you are. In some places it means uh, increased incidence of drought and desertification. In other ca cases, it means rising sea levels, rising salt levels in the soil as a consequence, and so on. Um, we're also uh, developing, uh, through, through the development of drought-tolerant maize, which we're supporting, we could help up to 40 million people in Africa uh, see increased yields by 2016. So there's research happening and, and application of research that's happening that has real results. We're also supporting 
uh, efforts to provide the kind of, of uh, uh, buffers and shock insurance. So through the new Alliance for Food Security and, Nutri and Nutrition, which is the G8 initiative focused on Africa, launched last year that I mentioned, uh, there, there is, uh, um, as part of that, support for the, d the development of, of climate risk indexed insurance uh. so that uh, there are payouts when certain thresholds are reached in terms of reduced rainfall. Or, are there or specific the like. companies that do that? Or countries, um, so or? It, at this point, it's something where there's a, a, a discussion going on among those who are interested in seeing this develop. And so it is companies like Swiss Re, mm -hmm. um, the, the Swiss reinsurance uh, firm, and uh, um, and the World Bank and a number of uh, governments and, and international institutions and the Gates Foundation and others to help uh, um, move this, this uh, thinking along. Um, there's uh, the, the US uh, through USAID is funding um, risk assessments that are being carried out by World Bank staff in several countries in Africa to help those countries get a better handle on the risks they face largely from climate change so that they can develop um, national risk management strategies so that the, the uh, host government or the, the national government of these countries can, can manage their risks themselves. We also are, are, are changing the way that we're responding to severe uh, uh, food availability crises, or food inavailability crises, um, as seen in the uh, uh, major drought in the Horn of Africa mm -hmm. uh, the year before last, which was the worst drought in 60 years. Um, but through integrated approaches where we um, are, do a better job of marrying up our urgent response, which is delivering food now, and our medium-term and long-term responses, which help farmers adopt maybe these improved crop varieties or um, improved uh, uh, pastoralist approaches that can help them ride out uh, um, uh, the, the, these crises, which, which uh, it's clear are, are going to be a recurring problem in the world to come as climate change takes hold. I want to interject yet another thing which I feel remiss in not. There's a reason. When you talk about short-term, medium-term, and long-term, we haven't really discussed population issues. And the reason I didn't raise it rapidly is when we talk about feeding the world in 2025, that bullet is out of the gun. And those numbers aren't going to change very much. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't do something about population, but actually, I think after we hit 9 billion, we'll start going down. It's just a question of, can we feed the world through those demographic transitions? But I think it's a problem along the lines of the climate change. So. Uh, uh, I would just suggest that maybe what we need to do is to open up the paradigm of adaptability even further in the sense that when you say adjusting to climate change, it is. It appears more and more inevitable that it's it's larger than we anyone expected ten years ago, and so if it, if that trend continues, it's going to be substantial. Something that struck me recently that I think might strike you as an amazing fact is is that in December of this year, they uh, the climate scientists. Uh, calculated the amount of ice being lost, that's fresh water, that's uh, blue water, I think you, you would call it, from uh, Greenland. Uh, just Greenland, of course that's a very big place, but just Greenland, the amount of fresh water when you compute it and compare it to the amount of water that's being used around the world for all human purposes, um, uh, uh, the, it's, it's approximately about a week and a half of melt from the Greenland glacier would support all the water needs. Uh, think about that and think about the fact that all the human water needs and think about the, the potential of, of somehow getting some of that water and transporting it elsewhere now that the ice is open. Uh, the excess numbers of tankers, you know, there are 5,000 or so oil tankers out there uh, that might be able to be used for acute water needs in various parts of the world if you could begin to harness that potential. So my point, though, is, is that it, it isn't all, it, in a sense, it's down to have all these things occurring. But what we need to do is to start to take advantage of these of these unusual circumstances that are developing and perhaps utilize them as a new source of solving problems that we now have. Could I say something about population? Uh, the first time I went to China was 1976, and their population was a little over a billion, I think. Now it's about 1.3, 1.4 billion. So it's grown maybe 20% in that, you know, 30-some years. 
China's footprint on the globe has grown maybe 15 times since that time. Mm -hmm. And so population matters, but you know, the other elephant in the room is consumption right. and waste. Right. The Natural Resources Defense Council issued a report last week uh, from farm to table in the United States, 40% of food is wasted. And much of that is landfilled, therefore creating new greenhouse gases to deal with. And globally, the figures aren't that much different. And so I think it's very difficult to talk about waste, especially, um, and consumption, especially in a planet where so many people don't have enough food. But I think that's a difficult, you know, that brings us back to issues about social justice and, and fairness. It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it used to be that, that population, any, saying anything negative about population was for exactly the reasons that Jim quite rightly points out, um, was, was a kind of blame the victim sort of mentality that um, you know, a, a single person in New York City uses as much energy as 40 Bangladeshis and so on. I mean, we, had that, we had that logic that it's our consumption, our unnecessary consumption that is more dangerous in effect. But I just want to suggest there's nothing wrong with worrying about population growth uh, for a number of reasons and the solutions are win-win. And again, I think about the southwestern Indian state of Kerala, 33 million people, which, which has done extraordinarily well on gender issues and they've reduced population growth and come to the break-even point much earlier than other places in the world um, made the demographic transition. And the reason was making sure that uh, infant mortality rates drop dramatically, that, that female morbidity rates drop, that little girls stay in school. But more important than staying in school is that they have careers when they leave school. So there's a reason to get an advanced degree. And, and so young women uh, from Kerala have gone all over the world. Uh, and are extraordinarily well educated. That means they're out of the breeding population much longer. Um, and then, and then they, the nutritional programs and the public health and, and um, public medicine programs have made it more likely that your children will survive. So one reason for having a lot of kids is that, that you wanna make sure someone takes care of you in your old age. So old age insurance, uh, coupled, I know my son doesn't, not gonna take care of me either, but. Uh, <clears throat> But coupling, I know it's a weak read to lean on, but uh, <laughs> I can say that again. right. But but coupling uh, old age insurance—that is what we call social security—with um, a higher survival rate among among children makes it more likely that people will will desire smaller families, which means that the children can all get the additional resources that the family has. So it is kind of a win-win situation that is that is pro-gender equality and pro-gender security uh, and probably makes the world a better place as well. We're a little bit, I think, uh, getting away from one of the principles of this conversation when we started this morning was how we're gonna feed a world. And uh, I'd like to just ask, who's gonna pay for it? Who's gonna pay for all this activity? I mean, the World Bank's got a million plus for Africa. State Department <coughs> has billions of dollars. So, uh, feed the Futures budget is a little Mike. over a billion dollars. Okay, sorry, Feed the Futures budget is a little over a billion a year. All right, so, so we have a few billion dollars sorry. here and there. Uh, President Kim has made agriculture one of his four foundation pieces. So who's gonna pay all the academic institutions to get the research done that needs to get done because we don't have the same robust kind of system I mean, everyone's competing for USAID grants or Hort Chris or Gates money. I mean, I, you can only imagine how many application Gates gets for the one dollar that they grant. So if, if we're having a shrinking pool of, of capability of money and most of the really dramatic research advances have been based on a appropriate amount of funding to allow the scientists, the researchers, the technicians, whatever you want to call them, to actually do the work. Where do we think that's going to come from? And, and of course, the private sector uh, has its own curiosity about how to spend money, and I'm part of that, and we think we do it well. But some discoveries that are so critical, like the submergence gene, sub-1 gene, which was David McKill when he was at Erie, he's now an adjunct at UC Davis, and he works for Mars Incorporated, but there's a connection, but we're picking up 
you know, some of the great scientists and putting them in cloister positions where they're working for private industry, well, their end game may not be as generous as we think it is unless we know how this is going to happen. When it works, it works well, like Jay Kiesling at Berkeley and Artemisinin, yeah. which he then patented and Berkeley patented in order to make it free to anyone. So anyone can use that. The cocoa genome is the same thing. We, right. pu we put it in the public domain so nobody could patent it, but everyone would have access to it. It seems, I mean, that's a really critical piece of it, I think. Um, I mean, the, it's not like there's less wealth in the world than there was 30 years ago. It's just in fewer and fewer it's hands. It's just 11 people <laughs> have it all. Right. So, I mean, I think the answer is not... Gosh, we've, we're short on our budgets. What can no, the private sector do? No, I think he was saying do? how we're going to pay for it. I don't yeah. think he was saying, I don't think we're suggesting there isn't enough money in the world to pay for these things. In the same way that there's not enough know-how to, is there anyone at this table who feels in 2025 there will be mass starvation in the world? Not one person. Me neither. Well, sorry, what, what do you mean by mass? I mean, given that, we're at 868 million people in the world today who yeah, are chronically like five undernourished. Times that, or four, okay. you know. No, because I would consider that a pretty big mass of it's people. It's mass. You're right. <laughs> Forgive me. But I, I guess I meant mega mass. And, and even if we cut that in half, I'd still count it as no, larger I'm than the population. No, I'm not suggesting we don't have US. a problem now and we might then. But the question was do you think we'll have a catastrophic problem then? And the answer seems to be no, which is what the answer I'd give. I think the question asked catastrophic is, is, is almost like precautionary principle to me. We, are, we, are, we have catastrophic hunger today. We will continue to have it because I can't see anyone who is leading a charge to solve the problems on a cohesive, coordinated, collaborative manner. So if, if we don't make that shift, to understanding what a sustainable system and whether it's mimicking nature or mimicking biotechnology, it makes no difference to the person who's starving. If we don't do that and we don't really agree to it and principle it and make it almost like dogma for governments, private industry, NGOs, governments, whatever, whatever it is, there will be massive starvation because it'll be controlled just like with water. Let me uh, say, oh. I was just going to, very me, briefly, just oh. uh, President Obama in his uh, second inaugural address identified uh, um, the, the challenge of ending extreme poverty in the world in the next two decades. That gets us um, a little beyond your, your 2025 uh, yeah. end point. But if we, if we make that course, poverty and hunger are extremely closely correlated. Sure. Um, and so if we resolve one, we should resolve the other. We'll still need to get the nutrition piece right but uh, those do go hand in hand. I, I We've been working it. on a, on a wait, different... Wait, let, let, oh, yeah, please. <laughs> Can I add one word here? Uh, you know, he's been trying to speak for so a long time. Go. How are we going to solve this in a cohesive, collaborative manner, you said, and no one is doing it? I would submit that the Gates Foundation has made a real effort to do it in a cohesive, collaborative manner, and they are the folks who have the most money. And look how little progress they have made in 15 years. The so other, this tells you how huge the problem is and how difficult it is to solve. On, uh, on public health, I would disagree with you a little. I think they've made a lot of progress. Um, but I also don't think that two really rich people who are incredibly smart and, and do the right thing should be the people that we rely on in the world no, to vaccinate no, Africa. I, I will buy that. But that they also involve a lot of other very smart people. They do. And but so, and, but look how little progress we have made, at least in the food. I, I can't speak to the, the health issue, although, uh, and so this tells you how difficult it is going to be uh, and how little probably we can do in the next, uh, accomplish. We can do a lot, but how, how little the statistics will change by 2025. Does everyone it's agree depressing. with that assessment? To me, it's depressing. Let me give you a, a word of encouragement, at least, and, and not for your depression, but at least to remove it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, we've not mentioned the R word. Uh, how many people know what the R word, word is? Well, it's religion. And the question, and when you think about it, most of the world 
uh, ha every religion in the world has programs to help the poor and feed people, provide food. Um, but it's done necessarily without much connection to the scientific world. So the idea is to join those two worlds. That is, instead of having a clash all the time between science and religion, actually make a dialogue, a constructive dialogue, so that there's information flow back and forth. And that is being done. I happen to be working on that right now. And it, it does make a difference. And people are following. And there are things that can be done on a massive scale because and, and when you can get into religious dialogue on top of that, you've got a new dimension uh, that begins to have a life of its own. So I think there really are possibilities for making a difference outside of the secular world, uh, but in a world that where, where everyone already subscribes to the notion and the whole ideal of, of providing for one's uh, neighbor. Um. We have to end, and that was a sort of cheerful note, and there haven't been that many in the last two minutes. So I kind of think we should end on that. And I'm, I just want to thank you all. I'm really grateful that you were so engaged and engaging and helped so much. It's not like we solved the problems, but there are smart people trying to deal with the problems and recognizing your problem is the first step. And I think we sort of do recognize it. Now we just have to go out and deal with it. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to, I'd like to thank all of you panelists for a very stimulating conversation. And uh, I guess if we were going to go back to, uh, we got to elect the right people. Uh, many of you would uh, fall into that category, but how about we elect you, Brian, <laughs> president, and have that cosmic viewpoint of what we can get done. Ignorance at the top. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. So would you please stay in the room, stand up, stretch. We're going to, this panel's going to sit down and still be with us, and our new panel is going to come up. But please stay in the room, but stand up, stretch. <laughs>